Good morning. Thanks for coming, especially to those of you who knew I would be speaking this morning and came anyway. It's very encouraging to me, and thank you, Pastor John, for the great opportunity. It's a, a, a daunting task to stand before the Church of God and proclaim his word, and I'm grateful for the time. I'm almost feeling that I, uh, you've already heard my sermon by John and by Mike, but I'm going to go through with it anyway because I wrote it. Uh, so, but first, uh, let, me, let me just pray. Oh, Lord, my prayer is simply that the words of my mouth and uh, the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The kingdom of God is relational. If you leave this service today and remember only one thing that I said, please remember this. The kingdom of God is relational. I've become thoroughly and increasingly infected with this simple truth since it was first explained to me and then demonstrated to me a long time ago by my spiritual mentor, Herman Canis. And uh, this last week, Herman, at the age of 88, uh, uh, realized a, a long dream that, that it was finally realized when he had the face-to-face -face meeting with his Lord and Savior that he'd been waiting so long for. So, this will be a bit of a tribute to, to my good friend Herman. My testimony is uh, basically simply that Jesus saved me from my sins. And along the way, I've been blessed by many, many people who have helped save me from myself. And uh, Herman is at the head of that group. But the kingdom of God is relational, and I don't believe there's a higher principle that should drive us in our Christian walk than this. The kingdom of God is relational, and behind that truth is something else we often forget, and that is that Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. That's what sets Christianity apart. That's what non-believers just don't honestly get, and, 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 and they can't. They think Christianity is just another religion, a belief system full of rules and regulations. But it's not that. It goes far beyond that. And to truly understand Christianity, one must realize that it is a relationship. So this morning, I'll give you a preview snack of Romans. We'll get there in a minute. I want to explore this concept of the kingdom of God, that it is relational. But first, I think we need to define what we mean by the kingdom of God. So just what is the kingdom of God? Or as Matthew usually calls it, the kingdom of heaven. Well, a kingdom is a form of government. So in the simplest of meanings, the kingdom of God is the government of God. Or uh, simply, yet, the way God does things. But just what is the kingdom or government of God? We should, we should probably know this because we pray for it all the time. When we pray, thy kingdom come, what are we asking for? We pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. What does that mean? Well, I believe the next phrase in the Lord's Prayer answers that. You all know it. Say it with me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is simply where God's will is done. And when we pray that, we're acknowledging that the kingdom of God does exist in heaven, where his will is always done, and we're praying that the same thing will be true here on earth. We're calling down God's kingdom to earth. We're asking that God's will be done on earth. And if we truly want that to come, want God's kingdom to come down to earth by his will being done on earth, should we not concentrate our every effort toward that end? I, I think so. So that leads us to the next question. What's God's will? Well, Scripture tells us that there's all kinds of things that are God's will. Romans 12, 2 says the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. 
1 Peter 2, 15 says, For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. 1 Thessalonians 5, 13 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. And there's many more places that gives us glimpses of what God's will is. And often God's will is expressed by his commands. He tells us what we need to do to live in his kingdom. In Matthew 22, when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus answered him by giving them the laws of relationships, two commands. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Two relational commandments. I believe Jesus was simply reminding us that the kingdom of God is relational. And that if we truly desire God's kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth, the first two things we need to work on are relationships. Our relationship with God and our relationships with each other. Jesus said everything hinges on these two things. Everything. And in the Greek, you know what that means? Everything. Yeah, that's what it means. Paul stresses this in Romans 14, 17. When he defines the word of God, I always love it when scripture gives us a clear definition of what something is. Faith is, and you know that. Well, here he's telling us about the kingdom of God. He says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's a very clear definition of the kingdom of God. So let's take a closer look at that verse. First of all, we're told what the kingdom of God is not. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. That is, it is not provisional or tangible. It doesn't consist of tangible things, but rather is wrapped up in relationships. It is righteousness and peace and joy that comes relationally through the Holy Spirit. Jesus teaches us that the kingdom comes first, then the needful, tangible, provisional things will follow. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, don't worry then, saying what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing, for the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. My translation of that says, work on relationships, don't worry about stuff. The kingdom of God is not provisional or tangible. Okay, so what is it if it's not provisional or tangible? Well, he tells us the kingdom of God is righteousness. So let's take a look at righteousness. What is righteousness? Well, scripturally, righteousness is being restored into a right relationship with God. And scripture is crystal clear exactly how that restoration of the relationship happens. We're told in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that he, that is God the Father, made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And it is only when we have embraced this imputed righteousness that we can begin to understand the depth of God's love for us to put us back into a right relationship with him and then begin to enter into proper relationships with each other. We're commanded to love our neighbor. That was the second command. But 1 John 4.19 tells us we can only love God and then others because he first loved us. Only when we have embraced God's love through his imputed righteousness to us can we demonstrate his love to our neighbors. The kingdom of God is righteousness. That is, 
being in right relationship with God and with our neighbors. And we need to remember this righteousness is imputed. It's not earned. It is not dependent on our behavior. We cannot earn our right standing with God. Now, certainly God wants our good behavior, but that's not what restores us to a right relationship with him. The restoration of right relationships is purely because of God's grace to us. So the kingdom of God is righteousness, righteousness before God, so we can then relate properly to our neighbor. But this righteousness is not earned, it's imputed. It's not behavioral, it's relational. The kingdom of God is also peace. Now, what do you think of when you think of peace? No strife, no war, no disagreement, no fighting, no persecution. Those may be what we usually think of when we think of peace, but I don't think that's what scripture is talking about. So what does scripture mean by peace? I would suggest that the peace scripture refers to is not the absence of conflict, but it is the absence of something and it's the presence of something else. What do you think that could be? Well, let's take a look at another passage. You all know that familiar passage in Philippians 4, 6, and 7 that says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Here we see that peace is the absence of anxiety and the presence of a relationship with God. We're invited to lay down our anxieties, thank God for what he's already done for us, restoring our relationship with him and making it possible for us to approach his throne in our time of need with his requests. And notice that this peace is not situational or circumstantial, it's relational. It makes no mention of whether we're in a time of turmoil or not. This peace has nothing to do with our present situation or circumstances. Ephesians 2.14 hammers this truth home when he tells us that he himself, that is Jesus, is our peace, echoing what Jesus taught his disciples in John 16. And by the way, uh, Mike did not read my notes before he quoted these scriptures, okay? Uh, John 16, 33 says, These things I've spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus made us a couple of promises in that verse. He promised us, one, that in the world we would have tribulations. And two, that we would find peace in him. The reason we can have peace in the middle of the tribulations that we will have is due to the relationship we have with Jesus. And this really was not a new teaching. Psalm 23 says, you prepare a table for me, where? In the presence of my enemies. Sit down, enjoy a peaceful meal surrounded by enemies. What? That's not what we usually think of by peace. Is it any wonder that Jesus is called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9, 6? And there's something else very interesting in the next verse. There will be no, any, no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Where there is God's government, his kingdom, there's peace. And the more we embrace his kingdom, the more peace increases. The kingdom of God is peace. And this peace is not situational or circumstantial. It's relational. 
The kingdom of God is also joy, and that's what we're stressing today with the joy Advent candle. But this joy is not the giddy, emotional feeling we get when everything's coming up roses. Although that's not a bad thing. The joy in the Holy Spirit is a relational joy. The deep inner conviction and assurance that the presence of the Lord is always with you. It's not an emotional joy based on things going our way. Jesus tells us about that in John 15, verses 9 to 11. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Can you see how these, this scriptural joy is relational? Is there anything in that passage that's produced by our emotions? Nothing. I'm not against expressing our emotions. God made us in emotional beings. And, and I believe we should properly demonstrate our emotions. But our emotions are not the source of our joy. The source of our joy is a relationship with our God. Now we may and probably should express this joy emotionally, but our emotions are not the source of that joy. The kingdom of God is joy, which is not emotional, it's relational. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is relational. Jesus talked often about the relationship he has with the Father. And when you think about it, the Godhead, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, it's the perfect picture of perfect relationships that have existed for all eternity. We sing, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. We can't understand that, but we can appreciate it. That is the ultimate example of relational perfection. And in those perfect relationships is the purest example of the kingdom of God. The relational aspect of the kingdom of God was specifically mentioned by Jesus in Luke 17, 20 and 21. Now he was questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming. And he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs that can be observed, nor will they say, look over there, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Or I love the J.B. Phillips translation, the kingdom of God is inside you. Wow. They didn't understand that yet. And I don't think I would have either because the Holy Spirit had not yet been given who would enlighten them regarding what Jesus meant. So, what will you take away today from this brief chat about the kingdom of God? I hope you'll remember that the kingdom of God is relational. Here's how I remind myself. Whenever I start to get worried about stuff or caught up in the concerns about provisional or tangible things, I try to remember that the kingdom of God is not provisional or tangible. It is relational. And Jesus said to seek it first and the provisional tangible things will follow. Whenever I get upset with others, I try to remind myself that the kingdom of God is righteousness. And I have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And I try to grant the same love and acceptance to others that God has granted me. I remember how I got into a right relationship with God. And it's amazing how that affects my attitude toward others. The kingdom of God is righteousness. It is righteous relationships first with God and then with my neighbor. The kingdom of God is righteousness, a righteousness that is not behavioral, it's relational. 
Whenever I get anxious about my situation or circumstances, I try to remember that the kingdom of God is peace. A peace that is not situational or circumstantial. A peace that is relational. And I try to rest in my relationship with Jesus as my peace, despite the circumstances that may be surrounding me. The kingdom of God is peace, which is neither situational nor circumstantial. It's relational. Whenever I let my emotions rule over me, I try to remember that the kingdom of God is joy and that the joy of the Lord is my strength, even when my emotions are all over the place. That joy is the assurance of the constant presence of God, no matter what an emotional mess I might be. The kingdom of God is joy, which is not emotional, it's relational. The kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is relational. And as I embrace this simple, profound truth, I am better able to cope with the tribulations that will come my way. And I'm better able to love God and love my neighbor. The kingdom of God is relational. Did, did I mention that the kingdom of God is relational? Okay, please, please remember that. Oh, one more thing. Uh, maybe you're here today or listening and, and you're realizing that you might not be in a right relationship with God. Or you might not be in right relationships with someone else. Or maybe you're wanting that right relationship for the first time. Maybe you've heard it a long time. And though you don't quite understand it, with all your heart, you're beginning to desire it. Or maybe you're looking for some peace in your life or some joy in your life, but you're carried away by anxieties and fears and emotional ups and downs. There will be elders and pastors up at the front, so we can help you pray for that and so that you can more fully understand that the kingdom of God is relational and it's centered in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me pray for all of us as we prepare for communion. Lord, I thank you that your kingdom is not eating and drinking, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I thank you for your imputed righteousness, for restoring us to a right relationship with you. I thank you that you are our peace, that we can truly experience peace in the midst of tribulation by pressing into you. I thank you, Jesus, that we can experience the same joy with you that you have with the Father. And that joy can become our strength in the time of need. I thank you that you have made it possible for us to experience a taste of your kingdom here on earth. And I earnestly pray that you would let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth through us as we live in relationship with you and with each other. Thank you for imputing your righteousness to us and blessing us with peace and joy. Amen.